getting on to our topic for tonight, uh, on the original schedule, it didn't have this title. It had a topic, um, Geography and Deuteronomy, and, and looking at particular places that are mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy and the spiritual lessons to be derived. We might still do that class, um, but we are covering quite a lot of the geography in various classes. So instead, I decided that well, I'll do a, uh, an extra bonus class. Um, that I haven't taught from Deuteronomy before, so uh, this is what we're getting tonight, and it's on what what we can see in Deuteronomy in terms of how to interpret as a Christian, as members of the, under the New Covenant, how do we interpret Old Testament law? How do we interpret Old Testament law? So tonight will be a slightly more technical class. So I hope you've, re you've reserved a little bit of brain power. Yeah. From your week, just just keep those grey cells moving slightly, all right, a little bit, and we're going to do a little bit of a, a group work as well, which always helps to keep us awake. So a bit more technical, um, not like the Moses class from last week, which was a more focused on some inspirational as well as educational things from life of Moses. But I think, though it's a little more technical, and I'm asking us to, you know, um, uh, focus a bit more tonight on, on that side of things. I think. It's important because if we understand the principles behind how we interpret Old Testament law, it has potentially great benefit for decades of future Bible study. Mm -hmm. The principles we're talking about tonight are the kinds of things that can help us with our personal Bible study to make it deeper and more accurate and hopefully also more applicable to our own lives. Also will help us in teaching about these issues with other people who may be confused on this kind of topic. So that's what we're talking about tonight. There is a lot of law in the book of Deuteronomy, you might have noticed. There's an awful lot of it. Once you get past about chapter 4 and onto chapter 5, you get the, the stipulations, as they're called sometimes. Um, the word law or command comes up in 125 of the verses in Deuteronomy. So that's a lot of verses. Uh, indeed, the phrase, the law, comes up 210 times in 210 verses in the New Testament. So if the law is talked about that much in the New Testament, it's clearly very important. And it's something we know, need to know better how to interpret and how to apply for our own life. Or we're going to be missing out on a lot. Yeah. There's a little graphic of the occurrences of the phrase, the law. Wow in the New Testament. And so we go from Matthew on the left through to Revelation on my, uh, on my right here. And you'll see a couple of spikes, mm. which you may not be surprised by if you, yeah. if you know your New Testament. Yeah. There's a big spike in Romans. Mm. And these, these are per, uh, per word. So in other words, it's not just there's a lot of references in Romans, but by per word in Romans there are a lot of references to the law. And again, you'd not be surprised at the spike in Galatians. Yeah. So we see those spikes, but interestingly, we see it fairly evenly through most of the New Testament. The law is talked about, not just in the Gospels, by the Pharisees, but also by New Testament writers. So it's something, if we understand the law better and how to interpret it better, it'll help us spiritually, I believe, a great deal. Mm. Jesus, of course, was questioned about the law. This is Matthew 12. If you can't read the text, if it's too small, then you can do as I'm doing, uh, turn to your Bible. At that time, Matthew 12, verse 1, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when his, he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or, haven't you read in the law that the priests are on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Referring to himself. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful? to heal on the Sabbath. He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it, lift it out? How much more valuable is a person 
than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. He was completely restored, just as sound as the other. And verse 11 shows you the significance of this for them. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. And of course, that seems somewhat ridiculous to us. But to them it wasn't. Their misunderstandings about the law would lead them to wish to kill the Son of God, mm -hmm. the Messiah, that they actually specifically were praying for. Wow. It's, it's easy to get misguided about matters of the law. So there's a lot of confusion even today, I would say, about it. People do question uh, people about the Sabbath. You may have Sabbatarians, you know, members of the um, Seventh-day Adventists, for example, keep the yeah. Sabbath. Uh, you may have people and friends, family members who ask you questions about the Christadelphians have some similar uh, um, connections with, with Old Testament law bringing it into the New Covenant. Um, so we're trying to figure out tonight how best to approach these issues. And I'd say there are probably two main approaches that people take towards understanding how to interpret the law. And, and these are on the handouts. But one is what might be called the traditional approach, which is to divide the law into three categories. And as you read through Deuteronomy, you'll see these, or you'll see uh, something like this, I think. The ceremonial law, the moral law, and the civil law. So the ceremonial law is things like uh, sacrifices that should be offered, uh, priests, worship, um, the rituals, like Deuteronomy 12, verse 27, present your burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord your God, both the meat and the blood, the blood your sacrifices must be poured, of your sacrifices must be poured beside the altar of the Lord your God, but you may eat the, uh, the meat. There are instructions about what to do with ceremonies and things like that. The second area is the moral law, which is the thou shalt not say, <laughs> honor your father or mother and that kind of thing. Deuteronomy 5.16, Deuteronomy 5, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long. And that it may go well with you in the land your, the Lord your God is giving you. And then the civil law. Mm -hmm. Things to do with forgiving uh, debts in the seventh year. Uh, what to do when you discover a dead body on the road. Uh, just <laughs> practical civil law, you could say. I uh, hope you haven't discovered a dead body on the road <laughs> recently, but because it, it could happen. Uh, things like Deuteronomy 14 verse 21. Do not eat anything you find already dead. Presumably including you, uh, bodies. I, I don't know, but you may, you may, this is interesting, you may give it to the foreigner residing in any of your towns and they may, they may eat it. The foreigners get the roadkill. Uh, or, or you may sell it to any other foreigner, but you are a people holy to the Lord your God, so don't, don't do that. So we have these three categories of law, and it can be handy to sort of categorize uh, those areas. Uh, that's the traditional approach. And it, they can be useful because um, it separates what, uh, more easily, what can and cannot apply, or, or at least we think it, it, it will help us to do that. So the, ge the general idea is to skip the ceremonial laws. Now we're in covenant people, we don't have to do any of that ceremonial stuff. And we can skip the civil laws, uh, the, the laws about what you do with a, a um, uh, with dead bodies on the road is you, you dial 999 <laughs> is what we do these days so there's, maybe they don't apply but the moral law it will be said uh, come, the morals that are the same in the New Testament come into the New Testament because God's morals don't change right? the, the ceremony, the ceremonial stuff, the civil stuff, okay that's an approach there are some drawbacks with that approach in that it does set us up over the law as to what is relevant or not. We kind of end up deciding that's relevant, that isn't. You know, like how accurate may we be with that, perhaps? Um, some of the laws are in more than one category. So if you're going to try and take it out of one, you know, not dis discount it because it's in one category, but it's in another, then you've got problems there. We, of course, may not understand the reason for the laws. I mean, we are uh, several thousand years later, and if we think, oh, well, we, you know, we just don't understand it, but we're not going to do it because it doesn't seem to be relevant, we may be you know, limited in our knowledge there and therefore throwing something out that God actually uh, uh, values. And also, although I've given you those three categories, the text itself, the Bible itself, doesn't distinguish in that way. It doesn't say these are ceremonial laws and these are moral laws and these are civil laws. It doesn't quite say it like that. So that's um, a reading of the laws. It's not illegitimate as such, but it's not in the text. So we've got to be a little careful about, uh, about that. 
And it could be argued that in many ways, all of the law is moral. All of it, in one sense, you could say, because it comes out of God's character. And it's for his people, whom he loves, and helping them to be his people. So there are challenges with that approach. So we're going to look at a different approach tonight, and then we're going to do a little group work. Perhaps there's a better way, certainly a different way, to approach interpreting the Old Testament laws. And one is simply this, that we use the New Testament as the interpretive grid. So rather than starting with the Old Testament and saying what can we Im or sh what should we import into the New Testament, instead we look at the New Testament and look at the Old Covenant through those through that lens, that grid, that window, and say now let's look through, let's start here and look back rather than starting the law and look forward. That may be helpful. It's also important to bear in mind that the blessing is in the Old Covenant. The material blessings were very conditional on their obedience on, on these certain ceremonial laws and so on. Um, and there's a very strong historical context and setting for this material. It's to do with them going into this land at this time. It, it doesn't necessarily apply, therefore, to us who are not going into that land at that time. And so there's the historical uh, issue. Uh, thirdly, um, the Mosaic Covenant... We are told in the New Testament those does no longer function. It doesn't function as a covenant. Uh, a few verses we just quickly turn to here. Uh, for example, a key passage would be 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's turn there. 2 Corinthians 3, which we might pick up at um, verse 6 maybe. Yes. 2 Corinthians 3. And verse 6, he, and here he's referring to God, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, new, not of the letter but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, so he's talking about the law here, that was what was engraved, right? came with glory, so the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, trans transitory that was, <coughs> Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? So that, that ministry brought death, this brings something more glorious. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in the comparison with the surpassing glory. If what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So we could go on there. But the, the former law and covenant was transitory, something else better and permanent has come. So the Mosaic law was always meant to be temporary. Uh, similarly, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, which we won't read now, although it would be fun to, there's so much wonderful stuff in Hebrews 8, one of my favourite chapters of Hebrews, they're all good though, don't want to offend anyone who wants to know Hebrews. Um, so, but here we have a great passage about the new covenant, and how amazing it is, and after talking about Jesus as the high priest of the new covenant, he goes on to quote this amazing uh, passage from Jeremiah 31, towards the, end of, uh, the middle and the end of Hebrews 8, if, uh, verse 7, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. And so it, he's saying that, you know, that there, was, there was a problem with the first one, and this is better. And he talks about putting the law in their mind, writing it on their heart. I will be their God, they will be my people. It's, it's, and by calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete nowadays, it will soon disappear. And chapter 9 says something similar. We'll leave that for now. It's on your handouts, I think. So uh, we have that Mosaic covenant no longer functioning. And then fourthly, um, the old covenant law is not applicable to us as law. And Galatians 3, in the book of Galatians as a whole, makes this very clear. And we'll just have a quick look at Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 25, to emphasize or underline this point. We'll start at verse 23. Galatians 3, 23. We'll start there. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So, the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now, now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So that law doesn't apply to us in the way it applied to the Israelites. And we can learn from it, but it's not a law for us. As someone put it, if you change citizenship from one country to the other, 
the laws of the first country no longer apply to you. It's the laws, it's the laws of the new country that apply to you. If you've changed your citizenship, some of us in this room I think have. And uh, so you would be more aware of that than someone who's just grown up in one culture with one set of laws. There are some laws that vary from country to country. For whether that's a good thing or not, that's the, that's the reality. So, perhaps with this in mind, these, um, these principles in mind, uh, we can go on to talk about five steps that we can apply to an Old Testament, Old Covenant law to try and work out whether it is relevant, applicable, or in what way it's applicable to a New Covenant Christian. And these five steps could be these. So I've put them um, in this order, starting from the, from, the, uh, from the base going to the top. So the first is, what did the text mean in its original context? What did it mean? We always do this in uh, what we call exegesis, trying to draw out the meaning of a text. What did it mean before we ask, what does it mean? If we start with what does it mean for us, I love this verse, it means this much to me. Well, it, that's nice it means that much to you, but is it actually what it, if we do, that's a very subjective personal reading, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but we cannot be sure that that verse applies to us unless we ask ourselves first the question, what did it mean to the original hearers of that command? The person who wrote it, what was their intention? What do we feel God wanted the message to be to that, those people at that time? So the first question is, what is the context of the, the text in its origins there. The next question is the audience. What are the differences between the biblical audience and ourselves? Now that may be obvious sometimes if you're a woman and it's, it's talking to men, in the, there's an obvious kind of difference there, but that may not be the main difference. But what are the differences between the people spoken to um, in this context of Deuteronomy, uh, people who've been following Moses, who, who are uh, a new generation coming out of the 40 years in the desert, uh, a generation taken out of Egypt and, and then uh, died in the desert and the new people and getting ready to go into the promised land and all that kind of... So what's the, what's the audience and what's the difference between their situation and our situation? Here we are in Bracknell Leisure Centre. So what's the difference? The third question would be, is there in this passage or in this law a theological principle? A principle. Maybe we might debate whether the particular practice should be something we do today, the ceremonial law or the moral law or the civil law, but is there a principle there that we think might apply? So that's the third question, is there a principle? The fourth question is, what does the New Testament have to say about this issue? Sometimes the New Testament is silent on an issue, sometimes though it speaks very directly, or sometimes indirectly or at least alludes to the issue. Is there a New Testament passage? by description or by teaching specifically of doctrine, that may apply here. Is there a reflection there? Sometimes, of course, the old law is a shadow of the things that are to come. Is there something there in the New Testament? And the final question is, uh, then, how should a Christian today apply the principle that we're drawing out here? But that's the final question. The first four questions are very important because we begin to strip away our preconceptions, our own assumptions and get to hopefully the, 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 the kernel of the nut here, the, the heart of it, so that then we can figure out, ah, okay, so for me, or people like me today, it, it could mean this. So those are our five steps. I'd like us to apply those to a passage we, we, could, we can look at tonight, which is Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. <laughs> a woman must not wear men's clothing. Oh, my God. Oh, we need to restore this teaching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All of you women wearing trousers. What is going on? A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. <laughs> For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Just that. We're going to take that, okay? I'd like you to talk to the person next to you, or two or three people, but not, not a big group. We won't have time for that, right? So just uh, two or three people, and apply these five things. That we just talked about, and it, again, how long we got? We got about six, seven minutes. Right, you got a bit of time. Work through as many of those questions as you can on this passage, and see what we come up with in a few minutes. Okay? Any questions? Just raise your hand or, or give me a shout. Okay, everybody. Let's just uh, see uh, a few things that we saw that we worked out, and see where we got to. So. Where's, uh... So, uh, context. Uh, how important is context in um, 
in this law, would you say? Or what, what is it about the context that might be relevant? Anything you, from there, Miko? It's, it's written to the, to the Jews who are about to cross to the communist land. These are all pretty much uh, born in the desert, so they've never even seen an organized society or, 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 or religious structure. Mm -hmm. There were not a lot in, in the desert, so they're now going to be stationary, they will need to form communities and, and settle down. So I think that's, that context is a very different. It's very different from what they've commonly been experiencing up yeah. to that point. Good point. Okay, thank you. And yes, Rudy. I think uh, similar to that is just that God is sending his people into this new land where there's all sorts of practices. Mm -hmm. Who knows what they will encounter? And they, they're supposed to be the model, the example of you know, who God is. And so God makes mm -hmm. you know, it's important for them to behave in the way that, that you know, God sees fit so people will you know, this is part of that. The distinctiveness, yes. Mm -hmm. I think for somebody like me, I see a scripture like that and I'm drawn to the word test. Mm -hmm. And I think. <gasps> God detest, that's a strong word. So the context helps me not to freak out and think, why would God have such a strong emotion to that sort of behavior? So it's helpful to know. Sure. Yeah, the preparing to go into the land, the land of Canaan was corrupt. And that's why God was going to utterly destroy everything because the influence of that land. So this may have been a preparation for them uh, because there was certainly homosexuality going on in the land mm -hmm. and uh, maybe all kinds of other perversions that uh, this was a warning mm -hmm. to prepare them going into the land. It's preparation isn't it? I mean they're mm -hmm. about to face some things they may not have seen or at least experienced yeah. in the same yeah. way. Perhaps they didn't even know this was that much of a problem. Yeah. But God knew it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So we're like uh, those of us who are parents, we often think about the sort of warnings we want to give our kids about things that they have not yet experienced. Right? Yeah. Those warnings, you and I will know, are not always very successful, but at least we have a clear conscience we said what we needed to say. So, uh, But there's something about that, I think, going on here. There is, uh, there is something there. Um, the, the distinction that God is uh, reinforcing here is important for some reason. There is and must be a reason that we may not fully ourselves fully grasp at this point. Uh, the word abomination in other translations or detests is very strong. Um, it does seem that confusing gender is the point, is the problem here. Let's talk about the, um, uh, the audience differences, differences between them and us. Their contact, or their, them and Th them in their context and us. What's well, the difference? They are, it's chosen people going into the, you know, the land, right. as we've just said, and, and about to enter into a place which is, you know, perhaps immoral or whatever. Mm. The context, I suppose, could be that you know, for us, we're already in it. We're in it. <laughs> Surrounded by it, submerged yeah. in it in some degree. Yeah, there's. The distinctions are, in the, I think, in this particular law are not so clear, perhaps, but nonetheless, they are, they are there. What about the theological principle? Do you think there's a principle here? Is there a principle that, that might be relevant to us? Uh, okay, Obi first. Um, essentially, that you know, God made man and made woman, and both were made in his image, and he values those differences, and mm -hmm. those differences aren't bad, but they're just different, and so God is trying to reinforce the importance of a man just embracing his manhood and a woman embracing her womanhood and not okay. trying to stray from that. Yeah, I'm not perhaps getting confused on that. God made both genders <coughs> glorious. And though we are all one in Christ, Galatians 3, yeah. in that sense, but that's about cohesive unity of community. That's not about blurring genders. That's a different, <coughs> different issue there. There's something glorious about the diversity there as well. Shelby? You talked about the idea of embracing a principle, embrace his plan rather than a preference or our own ideas. Okay, good. Uh, yes. I think. I think for me, um, this emphasizes the idea that it is important what we wish, and 
women should wear decent clothes. And, and I think it's often um, quite an issue where people, where they get women in the church, wear clothes which you would rather find in the world rather than in the church. And, and, and this emphasizes the importance of also the clothes that we wear. Yeah, there may be a principle there. I mean, though this passage isn't about that particular aspect of clothing, perhaps there's a principle behind that. Okay, and then um, New Testament teaching. Okay, there's any New Testament uh, passages you can think of that might connect with this in any way? Anything relevant? Yeah, Don? Uh, about being God's uh, cross ambassadors. Okay. So, you know, we are um, need to be worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. Okay. All right. Um, another hand. Oh, what was a hand? Is... No, you can think about it for a minute if you want. Okay. We'll come back. We'll come back to Tash. Uh, Heinrich. Um, perhaps being in the world and not of it. Okay. So not similar yeah. to the world that we're in. It. Good. Okay. Yeah. I think that's uh, Tash. You got you. Got it all in. Sorry. I don't know, but um, maybe scripture about not even a hint of. Immorality. Yeah. Not even a hint. Okay, so there's a clarity yeah. issue there, maybe. Yeah, Rose. I thought of the head covering in okay. terms of clothing for a woman mm -hmm. and the role um, that showing our submission to the male and respect of the male. Right, a headship in, issue. In talking or speaking out. Yeah, I mean, I think these are these are whether they're all directly applicable or not. These are this is how we should be thinking. And this illustrates how we think. That oh, let me think. Is there a scripture? Can I think of one? Is there a passage that has any connection? And then we might think of a passage and look at it and then reject it as not being relevant. But but we're going through that process is going to help us to figure out what the New Testament's perspective might be on something like this. So very good. And what about an, a Christian application? What about that? Yes, you have one. Uh, in terms of uh, the modern world as a Christian application, um, I kind of feel the world, the world, how it's heading towards more of like equality, um, men, women, equality, not in an offensive way to women, but uh, God's always set aside a particular set of characters for women and a particular set of characters for men, uh, which we in the process of getting into equality mix up and which is kind of getting into the family, causing a lot of problems. So yeah. probably um, in a kind of modern world, uh, the scripture would say, it's just, uh, I've given you commandments and I've given you uh, some special capabilities for women and men. So you basically carry out that rather than just trying to do the other ones, mm -hmm. which would mix up things. Okay, so we don't want to disturb the distinctions. Mm -hmm. I mean, God has made us equal, but he's not made us identical. So there's something about distinctions that's worth preserving. Okay, anything else? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, following on what Josh was saying, I think it's, it made me think that when you fill in form nowadays, it'll say, are you male, female, or other? <laughs> and it's actually become acceptable mm -hmm. that you could be whatever they call it, I don't know if it's transgender or whatever it is that they, they could. But it's funny how um, another thing I thought of we talked about going into the promised land and God's prepared them before that you're going to be different from them. Mm -hmm. And so often now, even as Christians, you want to be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So rather than making a big stand and, and it's like um, Johan was saying some of the bit of what Tash was saying is the girls' skirts are shorter and shorter or that it's whatever because we want to be like the world rather than standing up and saying no I'm going to have them and then make sure the tops are up here or whatever. Super. Alright. Um, Tony to do and then I'll wrap up. Okay. Tony go. I think there's something about um, really something that in this moment of field which I'm not sure about just obedience. It's about you don't have to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is yeah. sometimes yeah. Like something there is God. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. 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 Yeah, good point. Good point. I, th I think an, an important consideration is that 
God is saying that you, my people, must not do this, or, or at least you should set the example or be the ambassador. I think the danger is that we can become the ones that detest it and judge others because of it. Yeah. Mm. It doesn't say that we should do that. That's God's role. And I think the danger in today's society is that we can be judgmental yeah. and mm. detesting of people who may be gay or whatever. And, and I think that, I don't think Jesus would be that way, honestly. Um, so I think that we have to be very careful how we look at passages like this and think about if Jesus came today, would he be like that or would he be more like the woman when he met the woman at the well? Uh, it seems to be full of grace and love and actually no judgment. Uh, so, you know, I think we have to be careful with it because Deuteronomy is, is so much, there's so much, so much about rules. You can get lost in the rules and, and, and get lost in the judgment and become a Pharisee so easily. Yeah. Um, whereas we are meant to be like Christ and not like Pharisees. Good. So we've got, everybody in this room probably tends towards, I mean I'm generalizing here, but probably most of us tend towards either an over-liberal view or an over-harsh view yeah. on choices. Yeah. And so we need to know ourselves and then hear the right scriptures to correct us. There's clearly though, it is God's uh, perspective here that matters, not our own. I think it does seem to be something to me about not creating confusion over gender issues. Uh, it's about not presenting yourself as the other gender. I think that's it. It's not about wearing trousers. Uh, I wouldn't have thought, but uh, presenting oneself. Which is probably not the time to ask this question, because it probably needs a whole study, but... Um Philip met the, met the eunuch and converted him, and, and I have never fully understood the roles of the eunuchs, and mm. they were acceptable. They were probably dressed in female clothes, castrated males, were they? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but they're Philip. Excellent question. Yeah, it was the first conversion on the road. Um, that's a great question, and we don't, we, no, we can't deal with it right now, but, yeah. um, but I think. You know, for sure, in that context at least, um, the Ethiopian was somebody who had either chosen that lifestyle or had it forced upon him, possibly, um, at a time before he obviously met Christ. And uh, so things, his perspective, I'm sure, changed, even if his um, physical situation did. Let's put it that way. Um, no, I doubt it. But. Um, and it does seem to be something about pretending to be one gender when you're actually another. It's something I think is at the heart of what's going on here. And we know from Romans 1 that homosexuality is not something that God uh, accepts. Uh, mm. Though he would accept a homosexual in love. Mm. And, and that's an that's a interesting distinction, but that's a whole other class. So, uh, okay, I think that's what we're talking about. So we've done all that. And I just want to wrap up by saying that as you study through Deuteronomy, I would encourage you to not ignore the bits with the laws in. Yeah. Don't ignore it because it seems a bit irrelevant or boring. Mm. But instead, why not use this five-step filter to look at it and think, well, how can I find something in here that will be relevant for me? And I think you'll find a lot as you go through. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a lovely time of fellowship. See you soon.